Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 328, I chat with industry veteran Mike Heiss about what we both learned at the Simpty Technology Conference. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded October 28th, 2016 for November 3rd. Episode 328, Simpty Technology Conference. This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by CuriosityStream a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,500 documentaries and non-fiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for our audience, the first two months are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash twit and use the offer code twit. And buy Epson's new EcoTank printers. With Epson's line of SuperTank all-in-one printers, you can print thousands of documents without running out of ink. EcoTank is loaded and ready to print when you are. Visit epson.com slash ecotank to find out more. And buy Optical Cables by Corning. Corning's incredibly durable Thunderbolt and USB 3-point optical cables are longer, thinner, lighter, and stronger. Go to OpticalCablesByCorning.com to learn more. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the home theater geek and editor of AVSForum.com. This week's guest geek is Mike Heiss, a man of many hats. Longtime industry consultant and product manager, journalist with uh, Residential Systems, Twice and Hidden Wires, uh, former chair of the Cedia Tech uh, council and a jolly good Cedia fellow. <laughs> hey, Mike, welcome back to the show. Hi there, Scott. Well, I haven't seen you in at least a day. At, at least 24 hours. That's right. Both of us were at the Simpty Technology Conference, which was held this week in Hollywood, California, at the lovely Hollywood and Highland Center in the Ray Dolby Ballroom and elsewhere. And that's what was, we're going to be talking cool. about today. What's that? It was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. And that's what we're going to be talking about today because there was a lot of good stuff. Before we get to it, though, I want to make sure everybody knows that uh, those who are watching live, we, we are pre-recording. The show will be aired, so to speak, on uh, Thursday, November 3rd. But if you happen to be watching live at live.twit.tv, uh, you can join the chat room there. Or go to uh, irc.twit.tv and post questions for us as we go, and I'll pass along as many as I can. So, Mike, I think you and I would agree that this is pretty inside baseball stuff. It's not exactly the kinds of things that consumers typically think about or worry about. But then again, of course, we're all geeks on this bus, so it seems perfectly appropriate to me. Yeah, although uh, the, th the reason why I'm glad that you uh, asked me to join you on this is that there was a lot of inside baseball stuff that will help uh, – the viewers know why things are the way they are. And sometimes you can fix them and sometimes you can't. Sometimes you can't. That's right. You can't and always fix it in post. <laughs> Although they can try. And well, there are, there are some things in post that you can do that are quite wonderful actually. And we're going to talk about some of those. Indeed. So, um, let, let us start by saying that uh, this year, in fact, this month, I think, is Simpty's 100th birthday. Simpty is the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers that uh, was formed and started in 1916. So uh, this was a pretty big one for Simpty, and uh, they're planning a lot of hullabaloo around it. They, they're having a big giant gala tonight with guests of honor uh, James Cameron and Douglas Trumbull. And we don't rate, do we? No, we're just too cheap to afford the tickets. <laughs> I tried to actually get a get a comp in, and they no. said, "Nope, sorry, no can't way. do it." <laughs> so we'll sit here and uh, kibitz from the sidelines. Indeed. Oh, and uh, there there is one photo though I want to show 
which is, uh, I think, numbered zero. It's the photo of the two pins you got, which I thought were really cool. Tell us about well, that these. Well, that goes to the history of the 100 years, although this is not the 100th con uh, conference, but the no. uh, the one with the sprocket holes and the CRT, which I had to bribe them out of, is uh, evidence of kind of the 50s version of SMPTE. And the other one shows a film going in one side and, and digits going out the other. And and it's the SMPTE was originally SMPE, and they added the T for television later. When I first started going to these conferences in 19, oh, a long time ago, um, <laughs> there were film projectors and film cameras, none of that stuff anymore. None of that stuff anymore. Although, one of the things, one of the cool things at the show this year at the conference, they had actually two uh, exhibit areas. Um, up till now, it's been one, and they, they grew enough so that they needed a second exhibit area in which there was a beer garden, which was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> they had an Oktoberfest there uh, one day. Uh, but they also had a museum. And I wanted to show some pictures that I got of some of these these items that were in the museum that was really, really cool. Um, uh, I believe those are numbered one through four, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, here's the first one. And I'm going to call up my, uh, what I have here. This is the Jenkins portable film camera, which uh, has a mechanism that pulled the unexposed film from a light type box and fed the film behind the lens and put the film back in the same box and that you can see on the inside of the door that's kind of open there, uh, a diagram of how to thread the film. <laughs> the, the Bolexes I used to use in college had the same thing. Really? Well, how well, do you thread the camera? How do you thread? Yeah, exactly. But it had to be a little better, better than this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then, <clears throat> pardon me, the next one, uh, the next, uh, photo that I have is the uh, Jenkins film projector, uh, which, and all these, all these products that are on the order of a hundred years old, they might not be exactly a hundred, but they're close. Uh, they're all made by Jenkins. And I don't even know who Jenkins is or was. But he here's was an early. The, he Go was ahead. the founder of Simti and the stuff that he invented. I mean, people think of Zworkin and Farnsworth and Edison, but he was actually one of the, the key people in that early nascent era of uh, television and film uh, that invented a lot of this stuff. Wow. Wow. Okay. Well, there's a piece of information I didn't know. Uh, this is a projector uh, that uh, is called the Phantoscope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the light source was a carbon arc lamp, and um, it was hand cranked, just like the cameras were at that time. Uh, they actually had to crank them by hand, and the camera operators had to get practiced at cranking at a constant or consistent speed, uh, because otherwise, you know, things would look pretty weird, and they still did, because they couldn't actually maintain a very constant speed. Uh, and one and wasn't always in sync with the camera. Right. Right. It was all very strange. Uh, next up, we have the Jenkins Film Duplicator. This is a very early version of, uh, I guess, a telecine, uh, which, which in, in modern times scans film to digital. Here, it's, it's a device to actually make a copy of, of a film on another piece of film. Well, like an old, like a film printer in the days when men were men and film was film. But uh, <laughs> it got, I'll, I'll, I'll catch something for that. Um, but but you got to love the shutter on that thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. In fact, according to the signage on this thing, it said that the, actually the shutters for the projector. This was also a projector and a camera at the same time. And the shutters for the projector and camera are interconnected. So the original film and the duplicate film move in unison um, and so, yeah, so it had to be a, a projector and a camera at the same time because it was actually making a copy in the camera of the projected film, which was the original film. So that was kind of cool. But, well, and but actually kind of relevant because uh, there was a lot of discussion about the shutters and frame rates. So mm. uh, that that really was sort of the right thing to have. Yeah, exactly right. And we're going to get into that very much later. Uh, and then finally, we had an early television. That was cool. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it was. It's not even you know electronic. It's the. It's got a. I don't know if you can see it very well. It's got these this wheel in there. This sort of perforated wheel or spinning disc, um, and a special lamp that produced a modulated light representing the television image. Uh, the light it was focused mounted uh, by a series of lenses on this rotating disc and onto a mirror in the upper right corner of the screen uh, of the image here. And then that gets reflected onto that sort of translucent white, milky white looking little screen uh, to the left on the left side of the box. And that's the screen. And that was the size of the TV that you were watching. <laughs> But the cool thing, I asked the guy who is a sort of the docent there about the other box, the one without the screen, and you could call this the first component uh, television because there was no RF in the, the box with the scan wheel that you would receive the signal in the box that it looks like and indeed was a radio, and then that was connected to the TV, the display. Oh, so that box over there, I thought that was just a radio, but it was actually the audio portion of no, the TV? No, also that, that demodulated the signal as well. So that's how the information uh, for the uh, scanning went into the, the TV thing. Oh, see, I didn't understand that. I would have taken this picture a little differently had I known that. I thought it was just a separate thing that was just a radio, but no. No, that, that actually you couldn't a, use the TV without that. Right, right. Right. Hmm. It was cool. Okay. That's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, Swamp Rat, a film kinescope for a film? Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> that's exactly right. Well, so, be before, uh, before you leave Jenkins, though, I want to um, throw out a quote from uh, Jenkins, the founder of Simpty, which answers a lot of the questions I always see you're asking the uh, – uh, chat room. And he said, we are repeatedly told, this is from 1929, we are repeatedly told that it will be five to 10 years before the public will have perfect television receivers. One might truthfully say a thousand years for perfection is never attained. <laughs> Very good. Wow. That's exactly right. And, and certainly five or 10 years beyond 1929, we certainly did not have perfection. And not even <laughs> Even today, I, I would argue that we don't have perfection. We've got a whole lot better than they did in 1929 or 1939 or 1949. Um, and we heard or a lot of- Or even 1999, exactly. Uh, we heard uh, a number of people, in particular Doug Trumbull, uh, who gave the keynote on Tuesday with Robert Seidel, uh, who's the, now the current president of SIMPTI, and he's a VP of Advanced Technology at uh, CBS, uh, they were talking about the history of movies and TV. And we, I, I actually have a picture of, of the two of them during the keynote, uh, Seidel and Trumbull. There they are. Doug Trumbull is gesticulating wildly <laughs> <laughs> while Robert Seidel is chuckling at some joke he must have just made. <laughs> he's a great yeah. guy, too. Uh, yeah, I don't know him. I, I hope to maybe meet him and maybe even get him on the show. Oh, yeah. Because uh, he's seen a lot, so, and so has Doug Trumbull. Uh, but they talked a lot about the history and how things have been over the last hundred years and where they're going, where, where Doug Trumbull, anyway, wants to see them go. And uh, we're going to talk about that as well because uh, he is right in the thick of of the forefront, I should say, of of. TV and, and movie developments and what we might see in the future. Um, so I'll, as you pointed out to me, we, we talked uh, here and there during the show, and uh, there was an awful lot of talk about better pixels, right? Indeed. Uh, better and faster pixels. And uh, more. As and, and more as well. And we have you sent me a, co a photo of the Simpty Journal cover from... Uh, couple years ago, four years yeah, ago, was it? Yeah, 2014. Okay, so that's like only two years ago. Uh, the Motion Imaging Journal, more, better, faster pixels. And we've been talking about this for a couple of years, and we're still talking about it today. Typically, more is, is obvious, right? That's going from 1080p to 2160p, sometimes called 2K to 4K, quadrupling the number of pixels on the screen. Um, but also better pixels, and by that they typically mean high dynamic range and wide color gamut, uh, both of which are 
you know, prime topics for conversation these days. We now have some TVs that do it, that can do both and of those things. And high frame rate. And high frame rate is the faster pixels part. Yes. Uh, oh, because, oh. At, go ahead. No, I was going to say that w without jumping ahead, though, the one of the really uh, key papers that I uh, heard that I think goes to something, again, that, that's asked a lot here and that I deal with in, in the other uh, side of my life is that a lot of people are saying, ah, 4K, you know, it's more pixels. You, you, you know, if you sit too far back, you can't see the pixels. It, it's a scam like 3D. And there was a really interesting uh, paper that said, it's not just the pixels for pixels sakes, it's the additional spatial uh, resolution and the elimination of spatial artifacts that uh, you get from 4K. So it was sort of a, a plea not to just dismiss 4K as something you can't see if you sit too far back from the screen. Right, I, I agree with you 100%. This was one of the most important and illuminating uh, sessions that I heard there as well. We should say that this that this SIMPTI conference was a series of papers delivered over three days, plus some exhibit hall space with companies showing off their latest wares for the professional uh, movie makers, TV people, uh, and that sort of thing. And of the of all the papers that I heard, and I think you probably heard more of them than I did, but I heard a lot of them, and that was one of the most important. In particular, as you say, this guy said, yeah, okay, you, you know, the, the human visual system is yep. only, is only you can only resolve so much. And if you're sitting a normal distance away from a TV, say 10 feet, and, you're, and the TV is of a normal screen size, say 50, even 65 inches, uh, you're not going to see the added resolution of 4K because your eye can't resolve it. But, but, <laughs> and, and, and this is one to use for anybody who's trying to convince their significant other to buy a 4K TV set. Yeah. It's not pixels. Uh, and the best example from that talk was the jaggies and aliasing that you get. And the great graphic that that fellow showed was sort of a 45 degree a shot of a tennis court, and you could see where the uh, the sidelines were had jaggies, and then he showed a 4K version, and it evened out the image, and yes. and that was a really good way to say, don't think of the pixels just for resolution, but to think of the impact that they deliver. Exactly, and and the other thing that I thought was so wonderful that he mentioned was that if you have that much resolution, more resolution than your eye can see, so to speak, yep. you can apply filters to that information such that it, it smooths out those jaggies and uh, eliminates other artifacts that you might see without reducing the sharpness of the image that you're actually looking at. And without so, having to muck it up with a lot of processing. Right, right, like and, edge enhancement, that sort of thing. And and that's the kind of thing that they really prefer not to do. So I think that that's one of the hidden bonuses in 4K that is is overlooked. And that was one of the, the key takeaways I got from the conference. Yeah, yeah, me too. In fact, it's going to change the way that I write about that. You know, because I, I was in that group of people that he said – Hey, all these journalists, they all they talk about is, hey, you can't see 4K from 10 feet away on a 60-inch screen, so why bother? I was one of those what? guys. Uh, me too, but then here I, I've got another uh, quote from the paper. Uh, high dynamic range and wide color gamut enhance the impact of spatial artifacts. Stair steps and wari patterns at 500 to 1,000 nits, that's your HDR, are more apparent than at mm. 100 nits. Yep. So translate that for the Tylenol impaired out there, that <laughs> means that you really need, because of one of the downsides of HDR, uh, the people say, just give me 2K HDR, it won't look as good as 4K HDR. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, that, that was a real eye-opener for me as well. You know, we got a lot more to talk about. And before we okay. do, I'd like to thank one of our sponsors for this episode, which is actually one of my favorite streaming sites called CuriosityStream. 
It's the world's first ad-free nonfiction streaming service founded by John Hendricks, who is also the founder of the Discovery Channel, one of my favorite uh, TV channels. They have over 1,500 titles with 600 hours of content and over 50 hours of 4K content. It's available in 196 countries worldwide and available on many different platforms like a web app on Roku, Android, iOS, Chromecast, Amazon Fire, Amazon Kindle, and Apple TV. They have a wide variety of science and technology content, plus nature, history, and many other topics. In addition to documentaries, they also have interviews and lectures. Now, they've got some really cool stuff in their library, including... Stephen Hawking's Favorite Places. This is a brand new exclusive documentary in which Stephen Hawking pilots a fantastical CGI spaceship across the universe, making stops at Saturn and many of his other favorite destinations. <laughs> a show called Digits is a groundbreaking three-part series hosted by Derek Muller, creator of YouTube science channel uh, Veritasium, which explores online safety and security. That's pretty important. The series features never-before-seen interviews with former NSA contractor Edward Snowden. How about that? There's Deep Time History, an exclusive three-part original documentary series that tells the story of the universe's 14-billion-year history, including surprising twists to the story you thought you knew. There's also Underwater Wonders of the National Parks. I'm sure this is very beautiful. I can't wait to see it. In celebration of National Park Service Centennial Year, this exclusive seven-part series takes you on a journey below the bodies of water within America's national parks. Now, there are monthly and annual plans available, with annual plans offering notable savings. Plans start at just $2.99 per month, less than a cup of coffee or the cost of one title on a competing on-demand platform. So check out curiositystream.com slash twit. And use the promo code TWIT during sign-up to get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series completely free for the first 60 days. That's two entire months free of one of the largest nonfiction 4K libraries around. Just go to curiositystream.com slash TWIT and use the offer code TWIT at sign-up. And we thank CuriosityStream very much for their support of Home Theater Geeks. So <clears throat> we were talking there a little bit about uh, HDR, high dynamic range, and uh, Dolby had a particularly nice demo, I thought, of yeah. the of several different, a uh, couple different competing formats. As we know, there are several different types of high dynamic range. One is called HDR10. Uh, Dolby, of course, has Dolby Vision. And there's also this somewhat newer one from the BBC and NHK, which is uh, Jap Japan's public broadcasting network, called HLG, Hybrid Log Gamma. Although and, that's uh, inside baseball stuff. That's not. That's uh, one of the EOTF -E kind of things. But well, the, true. But, but the demo that, that uh, I know you took some pictures of really showed some interesting uh, aspects of that. They did. And uh, we have, um, let's see, what do I have here? Oh, I've got, let's go to number six, HDR10 versus DV, uh, which is the graphic in the original folder I sent you. Okay. And I'm going to take a look at that in, in my bigger Skype window. So on the, on the left is uh, uh, HDR10 and on the right is Dolby Vision. And they're both... Um, in a live broadcast situation. So it isn't a case like a movie where the colorist can go in after the fact and, and adjust things. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the, the TV on the left doesn't even know what the maximum brightness was on the monitor that, that the broadcaster was using to, to monitor this before it goes out. Uh, whereas, whereas the one on the right, being Dolby Vision, uh, actually, the metadata that comes embedded in Dolby Vision uh, has information about not only the maximum brightness overall, but the maximum brightness in each scene. It can even go down to the individual frame. So uh, this was a pretty interesting demo here, Mike. What did you uh, What did you I, take away from I, this? I agree, and in fact, one of the things that, uh, that you can see just from that picture that was was so stunning is 
uh, when folks like you and I take pictures that shows of things on monitors and you usually have to say, well, the resolution of my camera isn't as, as good and you can't see what I'm really or the, uh, or the dynamic range to. of the camera isn't good or the dynamic range of the, the, the display that people are watching this show on. But, but the really thing show that you it, just but. Ha but but there you could really see it on the image that that you just had. I mean, you look at the um, area underneath the table lamp where you can see on one side the patterning on the wall, and you you can't see it on the on the other side. Right, and then we have actually a second image, a second type of image on these two same monitors. Oh here yeah. The so you can see it there too. The Adobe Vision is quite a bit brighter, um, and uh, it just it just simply looked better. I mean, there's just no two ways about it. So, so now, here are the, the the things that I picked up from that is the guy said it's about bits, not nits. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good, but, exactly but right. The, but the other one that you and I uh, talked about at the show is uh, what that same fellow in the Dolby booth said. HDR is about preserving spatial detail, not brightness. It's about uh, it's about showing the image, not the container. And that's mm -hmm. the, the benefit that Dolby Vision has. Right, exactly. And in fact, isn't it interesting that uh, unlike those two particular examples that we just showed, in many, many cases, if you look at a standard dynamic range next to a high dynamic range of the image of the same thing, the high dynamic range will actually look overall a little darker. Yeah. Even though it's got brighter highlights and well, darker blacks when it comes to it. But, but overall, if you just take a quick impression of the whole picture, you kind of go, oh, yeah, that HDR image looks a little darker than the SDR image. Well, I, and that was one of the other things. And again, I, I know you couldn't get to, to all of the papers or we went to different ones, but that's why there was a lot of discussion about how you make an SDR out of an HDR or vice versa and all the yeah. tone mapping and how to make the display look like the image. Uh, that was uh, appeared to be a big topic of discussion. It was a very big topic of discussion and I did miss most of those, uh, but- but the whole issue of tone mapping uh, is something that I want to talk a little bit more about. Before we do, there were there was one other Dolby image from their booth that I wanted to show, which was when you were looking at those two screens we were just looking at, turn 90 degrees to your left and you saw this. Yep. Now, this was another live broadcast kind of situation. I mean, it wasn't actually live broadcast. It was pre-recorded, but it was as if it were a live broadcast. And what we're looking at here is... Um, on the top left is HLG, this hybrid log gamma in high dynamic range. Uh, and in the middle is, uh, I think, PQ, what they called PQ10, which is really HDR10. Uh, PQ being the electro optical transfer function, the, the mathematical formula that determines when the, pick, when the uh, display gets a particular value for brightness, how much light will it put out? And uh, that's one of the main differences between standard dynamic range and high dynamic range. And then on to the right, we see uh, PQ with dynamic metadata. And that's one of the big differences between HDR10 and Dolby Vision, both of which use PQ, by the way, as the EOTF. But uh, HDR10 uses what's called static metadata. So it only has one piece of information about how bright was the mastering monitor uh, what well, was the color gamut of the mastering monitor? And that's it for the whole content. Whereas with Dolby Vision, as we mentioned before, you can have different values for different um, different scenes, even different frames. So that was kind of interesting. And then the bottom two images there, bottom two screens in that image are standard dynamic range. And uh, it, go ahead. No, I was going to say that, that these uh, six monitors, in the middle one, I asked the fellow, I said, is that one broken? And he said, no, I just didn't have a, a feed for this one, and he forgot to take the sign down. Right, but right. Uh, the <laughs> difference there is a little harder to tell uh, yeah. from the photographic image uh, than the other one was. But it seems like people were kind of down on HLG, and yeah. I'm looking for my quote uh, HLG looks like 709 or SDR at the bottom end and squashes 
the high end looks depressed. Mm, so, yeah. so because uh, it's know, a hybrid system, it actually uses, uh, I think, I think, and if I'm not mistaken, I might be reverse, gamma at the low end, gamma is the standard dynamic range EOTF, electro-optical transfer function, that we have been using now for a very long time uh, in standard dynamic range TVs. And, and in the upper end of the brightness spectrum, it goes more to a logarithmic uh, curve, which is more applicable to um, high dynamic range. But light gamma, uh, HLG is relative. So you have to define where the zero point is and where the one point is. And that's, so that's the darkest and the brightest. Whereas PQ is uh, attached to uh, very specifically the brightness level that comes off the TV. So it's what's called an absolute EOTF as opposed to HLG or gamma, which are relative. Now we're getting pretty geeky here, so I hope everyone can follow along. Pass the aspirin. <laughs> yeah, pass the aspirin. Pass the Tylenol. Well, uh, <clears throat> it, it, it's interesting, though, because then that translates into one of the other uh, issues with the tone mapping and all, and all of that. And unfortunately, on the consumer side, we can't do too much. But one of the things they kept saying to the uh, people involved in coloring and creating the masters is know your monitor. Because, yes. and not just from a traditional ISFE, THXE kind of calibration, but to know the characteristics of the monitor so that you can map the content correctly so that you can interpret the uh, viewed image to match the actual image. Right. And this whole issue of tone mapping is so critically important in these early days of high dynamic range, because unlike standard dynamic range, which we've lived with for a long, long time now, that is very well defined. You have a peak brightness of 100 nits. You have um, a, a EOTF of gamma. You have a color gamut or a range called BT709. And the, the people who make the content conform to that. And the reason we calibrate consumer TVs is so that they also conform to it, which means that what you see coming into your TV from whatever source is going to look like what the content creator wanted it to look like. Kind of, sort of. Kind of, sort of. More or less. As close as we can get. Yeah. Nowadays, we have this high dynamic range, which means brighter brights, uh, wider colors, wider color gamut, a greater range of colors, a different EOTF. But it's not consistent. It's not standardized. Some content is mastered on displays that have a peak brightness of 1,000 nits. Some is mastered on a display that has a peak brightness of 4,000 nits. And then what are the capabilities of the TV at home? An OLED can't get much above 500. Uh, LCDs can get to 1,000 and even more. So it the question becomes... What do you do with all these different, you know, when the content was mastered one way and it's displayed on a different a screen with different capabilities? And, and the answer seemed to be you kind of punt. There was a lot of discussion. <laughs> I mean, seriously, there was a lot yeah. of that. Uh, discussion on that uh, on Thursday when I know you had to go off for another. Oh, yeah. Another appointment. A home yeah, theater like my podcast. Yeah. Like your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> But there was a lot of discussion about that, and uh, they weren't happy about that. I mean, there, there's never going to be just one. You've got HOG, you've got PQ, you've got, uh, you know, HDR10. You've got all these things, and and they weren't didn't seem to, the cr creatives weren't very happy about that. Mm. That's that's right. They weren't. And, and I'm not sure how it's going to shake out, right? Is there going to become a def well-defined standard like there is with H with SDR, standard dynamic range? I don't think so. No. Because one, one reason is we currently have TVs, TVs typically can do 500 to 1,000 nits. The monitors, mastering monitors can do 1,000, 2,000, even up to 4,000. But the PQ curve goes up to 10,000. And we may very well see in the future TVs and mastering monitors that can get brighter and brighter and brighter at, in the highlights. And so there, there's, it's an open-ended system in a way. Uh, I mean, once we hit 10,000 nits, then yeah, we're at the top. But that's not going to be for a while. 
And then you have to wear on that all the different aspects of distribution and adaptive bit rate and the coding. And on one of the papers on Thursday, they said they have to prepare as many as 30 different versions of the oh, same man. piece of content, yeah. not just for HDR and SDR and 4K and 2K, but the different channels that it goes out on uh, really is a problem. Mm. You mean like a broadcast versus uh, over the top versus Blu-ray, that sort of thing? Exactly. And then uh, the other thing that, that was some cause for concern was the encoding and the bit rate and the fact that even though people can brag about, well, I've got Google Fiber and I've got a gazillion gigabits coming into my house, but the uh, mezzanine that the thing between where it comes from and where it gets to you, you could have a gazillion gigabit fiber to your house. But if you look at uh, what Netflix has found, the average speed at the end of their pipe is only about six. And, and or less. You actually, you yeah. actually show, sent me a graphic. Um, I wanted to show that as well. Let me see if I can. I think it's number 11. We're getting out of order here a little bit. But Sorry. That's okay. Um, so tell us about what, what we're looking at here. Okay. Um, I, I, can you zoom that, zoom, zoom in on that or did I cut it all off? Uh, let me see what oh. I can do here. Okay. She, uh, Alex is our intrepid TD and he's going to see what he can there do. There you we go. go. Thanks, Alex. So what you're seeing on all of those uh, lines from left to right are measurements that Netflix is taking, and it's called the ISP index. Any anybody watching can can go search that out uh, on on them internets, and and you can see the latest uh, version of this. But each of the dots and each of the lines is the end speed that Netflix can see that a consumer is able to get out of the pipe, not the bandwidth. But the delivered thing, so you look at the top and you see there's nothing there that goes over four megabits per second. And that's kind of a little problematic when you're trying to do 4K and HDR. No kidding. Uh, Netflix and most <laughs> other providers say you really should have 15 to 20 megabits. Well, in order you to should. The you should. That's the problem. But the pipe gets constricted. And, and that there was a whole paper uh, where this actually uh, was brought up about adaptive bit rates. So what they try and do is mess a little with the compression, like you would in the variable variable bit rate on an optical disc, to try and maximize the picture for what's going to be at the end of the line. But then, as always, that uh, induces other artifact artifacts. So mm -hmm. you, you're really damned if you do and damned if you don't. Yeah, it's really a, it's a tough one, and and the SMPTE engineers and all these very very smart people are having to deal with all this all this stuff. We've got a lot more to talk about, but before we do, I'd like to thank another of our sponsors for this episode, which is Epson. Epson's revolutionary cartridge-free EcoTank line of printers for home and office introduce a new age in printing. The EcoTank forty five fifty wireless all in one printer doesn't use ink cartridges. Instead, it features an amazing, innovative, refillable ink tank, earning it the title of CES 2016 Innovation Awards honoree. So there's no more out-of-ink frustration. It includes up to two years of ink right in the box, which is equal to about 11,000 black pages or 8,500 color pages. You can save up to 80% on ink with low-cost replacement bottles. It's also powered by precision core printing technology. It has an auto two-sided printing and a 30-page auto document feeder and easy wireless printing from tablets and smartphones. All EcoTank printers deliver an unbeatable combination of convenience and value. With the Epson EcoTank line of printers, you'll have the freedom to print without running out of ink. In fact, the Epson EcoTank system was named the 2016 Small Biz Windows Printer of the Year. So visit epson.com slash ecotank today to transform the way your home, office, or work group prints. For the best combination of ease and value, turn to the Epson EcoTank printers. That's epson.com slash ecotank.
And we thank Epson for their support of Home Theater Geeks. Epson, exceed your vision. You know, one of the, uh, one of the uh, presentations that I saw that also I thought was really cool was by Sh uh, Shane Ruggieri of Dolby. He gave a presentation called Breaking Out of the 100-Knit Box, <laughs> a colorist's view of HDR grading. So this guy's a colorist, right, which is the guy who, who takes the movie or the scripted TV show and adjusts the color and makes sure everything's cool. Uh, and one of the things that he did that I thought was so cool was <laughs> he went out and measured the light levels in real world scenes. And we have these photos called brightness one and two. Uh, so here's brightness one. And this, I just, I, I, I just grabbed the screen out of the page out of his uh, PowerPoint. And so I, I'm, I'm grateful for that, but check it out. Um, you know, the, the dark, uh, the dark uh, floor, it's not a floor, it's the ground, I guess, is uh, 616. The dark wall is 340 nits. But then the bright wall in the sun is over 10,000 nits. Uh, so, so there's this huge range. And he had another example as well, brightness two, uh, which looks to me like it was taken at the Grove in uh, <laughs> down in West Hollywood. It's a shopping area that's uh, pretty cool, actually. Uh, but again, you can see th this wide range of brightnesses. And he was just curious. You know, he, he took his light meter and he just went and he pointed at different places and, and recorded what these, uh, what these values were. And so I thought that was really very cool. Uh, uh, the reason why I chuckled is when you said that there was something funny that he did is that he started the uh, paper wearing sunglasses. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and I it was on the that. title slide of the presentation. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was cool. I agree. Um, so he also made, made a couple of points that I thought were really cool. One was uh, the Alexa, the Arri Alexa camera, which is a very commonly used digital cinema camera, captures over 14 stops of dynamic range. Uh, and the Dolby Pulsar monitor... Uh, which is uh, the 4,000-nit monitor that a few studios are using, that can reproduce 19 stops, over 19 stops of, of uh, dynamic range with a peak brightness of 4,000 nits. Whereas the typical broadcast monitor can reproduce only seven or eight stops uh, of dynamic range. So right there is a problem because you really want a monitor when you're color grading, you want it to, to, be, to match the dynamic range coming off the camera. And in many cases, well, at least broadcast monitors, they don't. Well, it's interesting because I, I uh, uh, went off camera for a minute because I actually printed out a copy of the presentation I was uh, digging up off the floor. And what he <laughs> said, but, but to compens for, compensate for that, uh, there was one slide with uh, three keys to shooting good HDR. Understand the camera's latitude and color performance. You would hope that the DP would do that. But here I, it was one that goes to what you just said. Uh, I found interesting. Cut the recommended ISO, or if you will, the equivalent film speed, uh, right. by half or use one stop down in the lookup table, the, the thing that describes the tone mapping, and mm -hmm. then expose without losing highlights or shadow detail. So all of these guys are aware of this. They, they just aren't quite sure uh, uh, how to deal with it. Right, exactly. Well, and that's what this whole conference was about, was how do how the heck do we deal with this? So uh, <laughs> that was interesting. Yeah, I thought so too. Creamy Corncob in the chat room is saying, no way a single camera can capture five panels at different angles and make a comparison, is there? <laughs> and the answer is no. <laughs> There are a lot of reasons why you're talking, I think, about that, that shot I took, I showed you earlier with the five different uh, displays. Now, it's true that if you're off axis, there it is. If you're off axis from an LCD, and those are all LCD panels, um, then things will look different. And so I tried to get myself centered as much as possible. I think the off axis angle was pretty narrow. But you're right. There's no way that a camera can pick up everything that we saw in that demo. 
Uh, I just although it's it's worth noting that uh, those are Dolby, those in that photo. I asked them; those were Dolby Maui monitors. That's the oh, name of it. Right, and so they were really good. But to your point, you had to be there. That was one where you really had to look at it. Yeah, yeah. Ripple Rider in the chat room is saying, so massive broadcast compression will be the order of the day, especially with 4K HDR, yes? And I think the answer is yes, especially streaming. Yeah, I think you might, Ripple Rider, you might be talking about what we were talking about a little earlier in terms of, you know, what's the actual bandwidth coming into your house? It's less than four megabits, typically. So, yeah, they better compress the heck out of that thing. But but then for for all of that, another aspect of, of some of the presentations uh, for bitrate on Thursday was it's not just that you can comp compress it, but how you compress it. And mm. again, they got into this thing called a B just because we haven't had enough acronyms, uh, ABR, um, adaptive bitrate, which again is like what uh, uh, Blu-rays and DVDs have done where they shift the bitrate to how much compression is needed. But then they discovered that if you had a problem with the bit rate and the receiving device burped, it really didn't, uh, HDR doesn't like that, I guess mm. is the best way to describe that. So uh, there are a lot of problems and I guess they just don't know all the, they know the problems, they don't have the answers yet. Don't yet have all the answers, which is why this is the Wild West all yeah. over again. <laughs> uh, one thing that I wanted to make sure we talk a little bit about that you mentioned to me offline, is the concept of color volume, right? Normally we take a look, when we look at a color gamut, that is a range of colors, it's usually at one brightness, typically 50% or 75%, maybe 100%. But in fact, the range of colors changes as the brightness moves from black to white. And we have a, uh, a graphic to show that called color volume versus gamut. So... Notice that we it's actually a three-dimensional volume of color. And notice the dotted line kind of in the middle there. That is what we normally look at to see color gamut or range of colors. But really, we have to start thinking about what happens as we get brighter and as we get darker. Because as you can see, as we go down to the very bottom, the colors all kind of converge onto black. And as we get near the top of the brightness range, the colors all converge onto white. And we have to start thinking like this, uh, especially now with high dynamic range, because that volume is quite a bit larger than it is in standard dynamic range. That, that was one of the most, uh, another one of the more interesting papers. Uh, curiously, it was one of the few that was given by two women, two yes. really, really sharp ladies uh, who I've smart. heard before from Dolby. Um, uh, yeah, by and the way, their, their names are Jacqueline Pitt Lars and Elizabeth Pieri. If you can pronounce their names, you're a better man than I am. <laughs> but, uh, and again, I apologize. I'm looking at my notes here. Um, is that whenever, and, and I know you talk a lot about color, and we show that CIE 1931 uh, kind of flat diagram, and hint, hint, it's 1931, and the <laughs> research was actually done in the 20s. So yeah. uh, the quote that I, I want to read, uh, the real issue is where are the bits relative to the color points and color volume are the colors at intensity, and then the gamut for the actual color is what's being represented, represented in those uh, uh, color volume containers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the the guy who who did the color volume thing I don't think it was I don't think it was the two ladies but it might have been anyway it was pointed out that uh, the uh, high dynamic range color volume that that shape that we saw uh, is seventeen times bigger than yeah. it is for standard dynamic range yeah that was the guy that was the guy before them okay. Um, but in any event, it's it's really a, a different ball game entirely. Um, so that was uh, that was pretty interesting as well. The other thing that I wanted to talk about here, we've been talking a lot about high dynamic range, and that was certainly one of the main portions of the convention. But another one was high frame rate. Yeah, you know, and that is a I think more controversial. 
mean, everybody who sees high dynamic range goes, wow, that's great or wide color gamut, and they're really interrelated and always, almost always come together as a pair, as a unit. But uh, when you see that, you go, yeah, that's great. I want that. That's wonderful. When you see high frame rate, there becomes a divergence of opinion. Um, you know, we've been looking at movies for 100 years, at, or almost anyway, at 24 frames per second. And Mike, you probably know the reason why 24 frames per second was selected ultimately. It, well, it, it, these were all from the uh, 40s, 50s, 60s, and it's 24 here and 25 in Europe that in Europe, related right. to lime current and uh, how things are divided out. And then you have what are called fractionals when they had to sort of tweak it to fit the uh, color TV in. So right. uh, that's kind of where that's uh, – uh, related, but I, I think the uh, another message that that at least I took away from that, and I know you've spoken uh, to Douglas Trumbull about this, is not so much the notion of are we going to go from twenty four to thirty to sixty to one twenty, but this uh, uh, notion of shooting it at a three hundred frame per second, and three hundred is divisible both by. 50 and 60, which is key here, and then mm -hmm. deriving much better single frames from the multiple frames at the high frame rate. I yeah, hope that makes yeah. sense. Well, it, it, it does, and I'll, I'll reiterate here to make sure uh, that, yes, if, if you can shoot at a higher frame rate and then you want to take it down to 60 for TV or 30 or 24 for movies, you can do that by basically blending, uh, in the case of 120, if you shoot at 120 and you want to take it down to 24, you can blend five frames together and doing some fancy processing, get down to 24 frames per second. That'll look a lot better. Really than if you good. Had, really good than if you had shot at 24 to begin with. But And but that's, for all that's one of the keys, yeah. But for all the talk about the, the coolness of high frame rate, and again, I don't remember which speaker, but not everybody was up on it. And one of the guys even said, uh, yeah, that 24 frame per second, the Peter Jackson movie, <laughs> not so much. <laughs> I, I don't know if you were in the room when they said I wasn't. That. I, I would have laughed out loud if they had because that, Peter that's Jackson. That's right. All the people in the room did. Yeah, yeah. Because because the Peter Jackson, the Hobbit movies were shot at 48 frames per second. And this was a big experiment. It was a big deal because it was like one of the it was the probably the first movie to be shown at something higher than 24. Well, and, and that's why they're didn't all like looking it. forward to the didn't. Yang Lee thing. Yes, which I, I want to tell you about because I saw it. I actually got to go see wow. it. During the convention, there was a, a private screening that I was fortunate enough to be invited to um, that uh, that showed it. And I, and I want to tell you about it. Before I do, though, I want to make sure everybody understands that, as far as I know, the real reason why 24 frames per second was chosen as the standard frame rate in, in the United States, and I assume 25 uh, maybe in Europe uh, as well, but certainly 24, it was the s slowest frame rate that would support a decent sounding audio track yes. that was actually laid onto physical film, which is how the first yeah. talkies were made. Yes, in fact, they mentioned that, and I apologize. I had my TV hat on and, <laughs> and not my film hat. And yeah. um, they actually talked about that in some of the sessions. And another thing, which I think is more a bit of an urban legend, is that that was also determined in the... Jenkins, Jenkins era back in the 20s as yeah. to how fast uh, the projectionist could reliably crank the projector and have it be consistent. And uh, I think the sound thing is a little bit more uh, of the truth than, than the how, how fast they could so. crank it. But they did want to use as little film as possible because film was expensive. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. so the studio said, well, how slow can we get away with? Yeah. So I'm going to tell you I'm going to tell you about the Ang Lee movie here in a second. But before I do, we have a third sponsor for this episode that I'd like to tell you about, and that is Optical Cables by Corning. Now Corning can greatly improve your audio video workflow with their strong, durable, and far-reaching Thunderbolt and USB 3.0 fiber optic cables. Whether you're into high-end video, photography, audio production, or computing, 
Optical cables by Corning will allow you to build a convenient workspace through a superior long distance connection. Corning's USB 3.0 and Thunderbolt cables are incredibly strong and flexible. They have exceptional cable runs of up to 60 meters or 200 feet for Thunderbolt or 50 meters, 165 feet for USB 3, making it so easy to move noisy, space-consuming devices away from your workspace. You can even bend or walk on Corning, Corning's cables. And even if they're tangled, it's no problem. They keep transmitting at top speed. Optical cables by Corning will help you achieve acoustic and electrical isolation so you can enjoy a clutter-free, peaceful work environment. Now, one of the studios that uses Corning optical cables is Tonsauber Studio in Austria. They use Corning's USB 3-point optical cables to create an incredibly quiet recording space for live performances by placing all their noisy devices outside the control room. The cables were strong enough to be used outside the studio with no signal loss. So instead of investing in multiple extenders, adapters, and cables, turn to Optical Cables by Corning to establish the connection you need with one simple long-length cable. Optical Cables by Corning are available at all major electronics and professional AV retailers, including Apple Stores, Amazon, B&H, and more. Optical cables by Corning are longer, thinner, lighter, and stronger. Go to opticalcablesbycorning.com to learn more. And we thank Corning very much for their support of Home Theater Geeks. Okay, so Ang Lee's new movie, Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk. It's a very awkward, long name of a movie, but it's the same as the name of the novel on which it is based. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be invited to see it uh, during the Simpty Tech conference. And what's special about it, other than the fact that the movie itself as a movie is remarkable, uh, but Ang Lee wanted to push the boundaries of filmmaking, of movie making, I should say. I keep using the word film and it's, you know, it's not film anymore. There's almost no film. A couple of directors still use it, but uh, <clears throat> for the most part, it's all digital. And what Ang Lee did was he shot the entire thing in native 3D, that is two cameras on every shot, at 120 frames per second, five times the rate of 24, which is what we're all used to. What's the result? The result is motion is much, much sharper. Uh, he also did it in 4K resolution, uh, spatial resolution. So it's got much higher spatial resolution than we usually see. It's got much higher temporal resolution than we usually see. And a lot of people complain about that. Mike, I'm sure you must have heard people say, oh, you know, anything more than 24, it looks like video. It looks like, it doesn't look like cinema. I, you know, and I don't while like you were probably having fun at the screening, I was watching the papers <laughs> and, um, <laughs> it didn't invite. It didn't invite. It didn't share. I'm but, sorry. Uh, I apologize. No, I'm just kidding. No, no. But uh, there's a, a stoic squirrel, I believe it is, in the chat room mentioned uh, anything higher than 60 frames per second looks like video and un unnatural. And one of the things they said in some of the papers is part of it is that's director. Do records really sound better than CDs? Does analog really mm -hmm. sound worse or better than, vi than, uh, digital? Uh, exactly. when I was in the, in the uh, video business in the seventies, um, we'd have DPs come in shooting commercials on tape and absolutely put, uh, stockings in front of the cameras because they didn't want the video to look like video. And and there was no real answer to that. Uh, they did discuss it and really didn't re reach any conclusion. Yeah, interesting. I see the Stoic, uh, Stoic Squirrel's comment, 60 or higher in video just looks unnatural to me. Maybe I'm just not used to it. I think that's true. Ang Lee, after the screening, made a he came out with uh, one of his directors, Mark Platt, and uh, they had a little, little discussion after the show. And he said, related exactly to this point, that <clears throat> what he finds is frame rates up to 60, that is 24, 30, 48, 60, those kind of look artificial to him. 
And when you get beyond 60 to 120, or as you mentioned earlier, even 300, uh, then things start looking more natural. And there's another thing you can do to make it look less like video, which is the big complaint, and, and more like a movie, which was, was which that guy, uh, one of those talks talked about uh, in terms of if you shoot everything at 120 frames per second with what's a shutter angle of 360 degrees, all that means is as you're shooting each frame, the camera shutter stays open the entire time of the frame. Uh, in many other cases, it doesn't. It, it closes down partway through the frame. Uh, but if you do that, and then you run it through some post-processing, it was the guy from Real D. Yeah. Uh, and you can you can adjust the quote-unquote virtual shutter so that it looks more natural and more like that was uh, cool. And that was very cool. And I and Ang Lee did that in the end credits of the movie. You see credits for Real D, true motion and true image. Which for are that the process. Which are which are that process exactly? So I did not find. I, I went and saw The Hobbit at 48, 48 frames per second, 3D, and it did look kind of artificial to me. It looked like a PBS special. <laughs> you know, it was a soap opera. <laughs> well, or a soap opera. It's called the soap opera effect for a reason because it looks like a soap opera. But well, uh, this did not to me. This did not. It didn't look like 24. I will say that right up front. It did not look like 24 frames per second. But Ang Lee is trying to push the boundaries. He's trying to experiment. He's trying to develop a new cinematic language. So, of course, it's going to look different. To my eye, it looked so much better. It was so involving. It drew me into the story. I've heard people complain. They showed this at the New York Film Festival this, uh, for the first time. Its premiere was at the New York Film Festival earlier this month. And I read a lot of stories about, oh, it just, just distracted me from the story and I couldn't get into it. It pulled me into the story more. I got more emotionally involved. And this was projected at 120. It wasn't, yes, you know, it was. processed it was down. Yeah, it was projected it, at 120. But interestingly, at 2K spatial resolution, because mm, there, mm, are mm. No, there are no uh, DCI, digital cinema yeah. projectors, that can do 4K at 120 frames per second. Well, history uh, repeats itself because you mentioned uh, correctly that the 24, 25 frame per second, part of that was they didn't want to use a lot of film because film was expensive. But yep. just imagine how much storage is needed for 120 frames per second. Oh, uh, man. And and the you know the creatives may think it's cool the suits not so much <laughs> yes but you know storage is, is get is very cheap these days right but you're right it takes a hell of a lot of storage I mean 120 frames per second is five times the amount of information at 24 4K instead of 2K is four times the amount of information 3D means two eyes worth so that doubles it again. Um, so it's it's a massive amount of data, no question about it. And, and to make it worse, I was at uh, a different uh, Cynthia or TV Academy uh, presentation uh, a while ago, and they said that because the the creatives is the suits always it's the suits versus the creatives like that. Yes, the Hatfields yeah, yeah, yeah. and the McCoys. Right, right, right. And the money, the money what, men versus the dreamers. Yeah, exactly. But but what they said, which actually does make sense, is there was a a physical relationship to film. So when they said cut, they meant cut, stop, stop the camera, because that bloody film is expensive. But since you don't have a uh, physical relationship with the storage, they when they say cut, things keep rolling and they they keep it. It's not cut and print, cut and print. It's cut and keep. And mm. that's where all the storage costs uh, right. just you know, mount up. takes and stuff yep. like that. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Exactly. Well, some of the other interesting things about this, and by the way, I wrote a pretty long piece on it on AVS Forum. Uh, it's still on the on the homepage, so I encourage you to go read it because there's a lot of information about this movie. Uh, because it was shot in 4K at 120 frames per second in 3D, uh, Ang Lee found that, the actors who, if they were wearing makeup, 
it didn't work. It mm. looked too obvious. And so none mm. of the actors, except I think the uh, the one one of the the performers on the foot on the halftime show, which is in the name of the movie, Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk, uh, was wearing makeup. But nobody else in the movie was wearing makeup. Wow. Uh, because it was just too too obvious. And they, he also had to direct them to put on a different mindset about their craft of acting. They had to internalize their character more. They had to be more genuine, more authentic than they might otherwise be because the camera is picking up so much. I mean, it's picking up changes in skin color as, as, as somebody got angry, say, or something like that. Uh, remarkable. Really, really hey. remarkable. But again, I think the cost, I mean, it's great for an epic. It's just like, um, what was the, uh, there was a movie uh, that was shot recently in uh, 70 millimeter or 65 millimeter, projected six, uh, 70 millimeter recently, but it was oh, just uh, so. Probably uh, Quentin Tarantino's. Uh, that's Hateful the one, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, <clears throat> you know, it was great, but it became what in the old days used to call a road show uh, uh, picture because it was just so frightfully expensive uh, that I think 120 frames for uh, projection uh, for actual end use is, it's just going to be an oddity. Well, you know, again, we'll see what the TVs uh, and, and so on are capable of. Creamy Corncob in the chat room is saying 120 frames per second on Leo's OLED panel with HDR from the Xbox One would look, al look almost like looking out a window, wouldn't it? The answer is yes. If his TV could do 120 frames per second, it can't. Well, and uh, to some it will, and to some it won't. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but certainly the motion is faster. I, I mentioned in this, uh, much clearer, I mentioned in this article that there's a, several scenes where they're in Iraq. There is a story of an army unit that comes back from Iraq, uh, and there are flashbacks to when they're in Iraq, and they're riding along in a Humvee, right? They're zooming along the desert, and they're bouncing all over the place. And in a, you know, in 24 frames per second, that would just be a blurry mess. Uh, but in this, you can actually still see their faces. You can see the expression on their faces. Uh, things are clearer. And so I just found it so compelling. And well, I hope even, people... Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, well, in that real, in the real D demo, there was one where they had the... Uh, the convertible uh, going down the street, and you almost, you actually saw a double image. Um, yes, yes, exactly. And, 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 you know, that sort of is a really uh, visible way of saying high frame rate is good. The question is maybe how high does it really need? Where's the, the point of diminishing return? Right. There was one session you'll, you might remember called, uh, is there an uncanny valley at high <laughs> frame rate? That one. Uh, which was... You know, you know about the uncanny valley in, in animation? Yeah. Are you familiar with that term? Yeah. So basically, this is why when we get animation animated movies these days, the grass and the animals and everybody are photorealistic now. Animation can has gotten that good. But the people look obviously animated. And the reason is, as you get closer and closer and closer to photorealism with human faces... There comes a point where it looks really creepy. Do you remember the movie The Polar Express? I missed that one. Okay, Tom Hanks. This was a this was a, a mocap movie. Okay, so oh, Tom Hanks. Oh, that was kind of a Christmassy kind of. thing. It was a Christmassy movie. Yeah, so it'll it'll be coming up pretty soon here, probably on TV. Uh, it's it was basically Tom Hanks and and the kids and other actors doing motion capture, and then they turned that into animation. And they tried to make it as photorealistic as possible. But those faces, those human faces, just look creepy. Ah, fix it in post. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in fact, here it is. And the reason yeah. is that we as human beings are so attuned to human faces that when it gets close enough but not quite there, we kind of go, ew. <laughs> <laughs> so that's called the uncanny valley. And this guy at the at the Simpty Tech Conference was wondering if there was such a thing in high frame rate as well. And, well, and it's interesting. There wasn't any discussion. There was this year, and I, as I said, I've been going to this thing for probably way too long. There <laughs> was very little discussion about sound. 
Uh, there were just maybe three or four papers, uh, which unfortunately I didn't go to because I'm a video guy. Uh, there right. was very little discussion of sound and there was no uh, discussion at all about animation. Right, right. I, there were a couple papers on sound. I missed them too, unfortunately. Um, another couple of topics that I just wanted to touch upon and we're really running out of time here. Uh, there were there was at least one paper on immersive movie formats like Barco Escape. Have you ever seen Barco Escape? No, I haven't. That was re really looked fascinating. I don't know. I, I guess I'd hey, let's go to Europe and see it. Well, there is one here in L.A. Uh, oh wow! And, yeah, it's down at the um, uh, it's down at the Promenade in the Hughes Center down by LAX. Oh right, yeah. Um, there, it's a Cinemark theater. And so you've yep. got a screen in front of you as normal and then two screens on the side. And you got projectors shooting onto those side screens as well as the front screen. And so it looks like you're kind of surrounded by imagery. I, I actually went down there once to try and see Maze Runner, uh, The Scorch Trials, which was being shown in Barco Escape, <laughs> but it wasn't working. <laughs> so I didn't actually get to see it. What I did notice, however, was that Unless you were sitting pretty close and actually looking up at the screen more than I like to, it would not have been that interesting. It would not have been that – you wouldn't have seen it in your peripheral vision. It would have just looked like kind of you were looking into a box. I mean, you have to really sit far back to get the advantage of that. No, no, you have to sit far forward in order oh, to okay. have this, – this because the, the two side screens are right up or connected almost to the front screen. Oh, they're, wow. They're, their edges are are aligned. So that it looks like sort of like one contiguous image. Cinerama uh, with video projectors. Exactly. Well, and that that's what Cinerama was in the in the beginning. So this is uh, an, another attempt at that. There was also some talk of uh, virtual reality, and I don't I didn't get to any of that. Did you? No, I didn't. Although uh, that was where uh, the 4K uh, sort of leaked in. Uh, to VR and some of the presentations where they said that because of that same near to eye kind of thing, there was a, a big push to try and do, I don't think anybody's doing it yet, but 4K uh, for VR type applications. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've certainly seen a little bit of VR and it has seemed so low res to me. I mean, I can clearly see the pixel structure and looking around, there's a delay and it just, it's not very satisfying yet. This is a really nascent technology uh, that uh, that the SMPTE people are thinking about how to make better, and I'm glad that they are. The, the one anecdotal thing, I, I know you're, you're running out of time, but uh, what I thought was the best funny paper, which is sort of something you don't see at a thing like SMPTE, was the fellow from the Department of Defense about um, analyzing video that would come in from you know, where he can't tell you where it came from. And how they could, <laughs> but but he did uh, video analysis to determine uh, the video equivalent of was this photoshopped or not. Wow, I missed that one. And it was it was outstanding. And he, you know, showed and again, it was kind of a I could tell you what this is, but I'd have to kill you uh, <laughs> kind of thing. But it, it was really interesting to show how they dissect video to see if the bad guys really did what they say they did or could do what they said they could do. And the best advantage is he had some still shots from some Chinese propaganda propaganda film claiming it was their new fighter jet and was shooting bad guys, the ability to shoot bad guys out of the sky. And they analyzed it and found that they'd uh, sort of put in some frames from Top Gun. <laughs> oh, and, man. And he showed how the analysis of how they determined that. Wow, and that wow. was, you know, just sort of a little uh, light uh, aspect of the uh, of the proceedings. Oh, man, that is very, very cool. Well, on <laughs> that's a great note to end on. I thank you for that. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> pardon me. I laughed so hard. I uh, <laughs> gave myself conniption fit there. <laughs> hey, you uh, can fix thank it in you. post. I'll fix it in post. Yes. Uh, the, the editors, I'll fix it in post. Uh, I want to thank you so much for being here, Mike. It's been a great time. Wonderful talking with you as always. Thank and, you very much. Uh, thanks a lot for being here. That's Mike Heiss, 
uh, a, a longtime member of our community and uh, a jolly good CDA fellow, I always like to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can find his stuff at residentialsystems.com, also at hiddenwires.co.uk. And you can follow him on Twitter at CaptainVid, C-A-P-T-N-V-I-D. Mike, thanks again. Thanks very much, Scott. That was always a pleasure. Thank you so much. You can find me always at avsforum.com. You can email me at scott at twit.tv. And you can follow me on Twitter at htgeekscott and at avsforum. And you can always find previous episodes of Home Theater Geeks right here at twit.tv slash htg uh, or on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash twit home theater geeks. Next week, my guest geek is scheduled to be Don Stewart, one of the famous Stewart family that founded Stewart Film Screen many, many years ago. He's the latest generation. And he's going to be talking about what else? Projection screens, particularly the new Phantom high ambient light rejecting material. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more about that. And I hope you will join us. Until then, geek out. <laughs>